Good morning, church. Morning. If you don't feel good, just look outside for a minute. You'll feel a lot better. Amen. It is beautiful. Our good Lord did that. I didn't have anything to do with it, but I sure do appreciate it, don't you? Amen. This morning, I have picked a subject. I found this, and I love this idea. I absolutely love it. This morning, we're going to study on uh, Mary's First Communion. We're going to gather around that table before this complete worship service is over. And we, as the church that has come together this morning, are going to partake of the Lord's table in remembrance of Jesus Christ. We're definitely going to do that. We know that. But this morning, I hope and pray that this lesson will make us more in tune with where our hearts and our thoughts ought to be as we do that. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. The they and they, here's who we're talking about there. They is also us. All those that were baptized, if you look at verse 41, the verse before that, all those that were baptized into Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, uh, were continuing steadfastly. Also, those that believed in verse 44, those that believed in verse 44, those that were baptized in verse 41, they go together. All those are they. And they continued steadfastly. Continued steadfastly. If I ask you to show me the verse where it tells us we don't have to partake of the Lord's Supper, the communion, to remember His death, burial, resurrection, or death and burial in our behalf, could you find that verse somewhere? No. I'll save you the time. Could you find the verse where we're to do that every once in a while or when we get ready to or on, on what a uh, holiday of Christmas or a holiday of Easter might be? No, you can't. You can't. But we're going to talk about that in a minute and how important it is to us to continue steadfastly, never quitting, and steadfast, strong. We will not be moved from doing what we're supposed to do. We will not. This verse speaks of the new Christians back then. The New Testament Christians being so devoted. Will you please show me the verse where it says we don't have to be devoted today? Well, the laws say, I don't care what the laws say, what does God say? We're, they were devoted. They continued to do that to the last breath in their body. And Lord willing, we will too. In Matthew 28, 19, and 20, Jesus charges His apostles after they had baptized people that they should teach them to observe all that He had commanded. Now, all these followers, all these people, all these people that believed in Jesus Christ. Do you think His mother Mary believed in Jesus Christ? I think she did. You know, if we're going to function as Christians like these people were so devoted, we've got to apply all four activities listed. We have to. All those listed in Acts 2.42, let's do all four every time. Because we're to do the same thing today as they did then. We're to stay one part of that first. The first one is in the apostles' doctrine or teaching. They stay within the one doctrine. The apostles' doctrine. Well, I thought it was called something else. It is, but it's the same doctrine. See, the apostles' doctrine is the teachings that they were taught by whom? Christ. 
Christ taught His doctrine to the apostles. The doctrine of Christ actually is the same doctrine as His Father. 2 John, verse 9 and 10, says it plainly. So there's only one doctrine that we're to go by. And it is written in this book. It is not written in any outside doctrinal book written by man. Only this one that was written by the Holy Spirit as He moved through man. 2 Peter 1.21 That's the first thing they did. They continued to do that till they died. And brothers and sisters, we have to continue to do the same thing until the day we die. I think we would all agree with that. Fellowship was another thing they did. Fellowship is sharing a common meal mentioned in verse 46, four verses later. We will, we will joy, enjoy fellowship in common meals because we're brothers and sisters. After worship, we might go here, go there, go back here in the fellowship hall. But in verse 42, we're referring to worship. We have a common bond with all of us, church. Fellowship in and out of the worship service. And that common bond, the fellowship that we enjoy, is in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. We were all baptized into the body of Christ. And we put on Christ. And that keeps us together. We are God's children in Christ and we have the doctrine of Christ that we go by. And in 1 John 1.3, we also see that we have a fellowship, we have a common bond with Jesus and His Father God. As a matter of fact, in 2 Corinthians 13 and 14, we also have fellowship or that common bond with the Holy Spirit Himself. That's where we're united, church. The family of God. One doctrine, one church, one fellowship, one mind, one spirit. Ephesians 4, 4 and 5. 1 John 1 says, We're to walk in the light as He, Jesus, is in the light. And to have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Christ will cleanse us from sin. You know, Jesus Christ, His mother, don't you know she had fellowship with all those other followers of Christ that, like any mother, if your son was Jesus and you see all these followers, would you not want to have fellowship with them? Would you not want to surround yourself with them? Of course you would. And we do too. And by the way, you don't have to be a mother of Christ to do that. You have to be a child of God. To want to do that today. The Greek word for fellowship is koinonia. How do I know that? I pulled it up on YouTube. It can refer to a common bond, including communion. Communion is found in 1 Corinthians 10 16. Think of this this morning when we're partaking of our communion, our fellowship together and partaking of the bread. 1 Corinthians 6, 10, 16 says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Of course it is. We know that that cup represents symbolically the blood of Jesus Christ that washes away our sins if we've been baptized into Christ. We also know that, to finish the verse, the, the bread which we will break is, not the commun is it not the communion, all of us together, thinking and remembering the body of Christ? You bet it is. Absolutely. See, we're to do this, 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25, listen to exactly what it says. And when He, Jesus, had given thanks... He broke it and said, Take it. This is my body, which is broken for you. And do this in remembrance of me. Let me stop for just a second and look at someone else that we might mention right here. 
Do you believe that the mother of Jesus Christ, Mary, the real mother, would remember her son through communion even after he's gone? Do you think so? Do you think she might have an attitude of it's not that important? If I show up, I might partake of it. Or if I don't, I won't worry about it. I don't think so. Verse 25, In the same manner He also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant. The new covenant right here. The New Testament. Jesus is our King. The cup is the new covenant of My blood. We're bought and paid for, church, by the blood of Jesus Christ. This do as often as you drink it. How? In remembrance of me, what I did for you. I want you to remember me. I love you and I loved you so much I was willing for them to put me on the cross to die for you. You. I told you who they were a while ago. Let me tell you who you are. Die, God, Jesus Christ died for you. That's each one here that has been baptized into the body of Christ. We see in Matthew 26, 26 through 9, uh, 29, Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper that we're going to partake of. Again, his mother knew this. She was taught these things. This is her son. She hung on every word she could hear from him. Don't you know the mother of Jesus Christ had to love him? I would dare say without any doubt that any mother in here understands that feeling understands that feeling. And we're going to go why you are so close and so loving to your children as we go through this sermon. Because you, of all people, can truly relate to Mary and the communion. Seven centuries before the birth of Jesus Christ, Isaiah prophesied that a virgin would conceive and bear a son. Isaiah 7.14 Mary was brought up under the old law. She was taught the old law. She was learned under the old law like all of them were. She knew of this prophecy. I'm guessing, of course, that she wondered who that might be when she heard that prophecy. Wouldn't it be great if I could meet the woman that would be the mother of the Son of God? Wouldn't that be something? Can you imagine how, with this woman knowing this prophecy might happen one day, knowing this Son would be called Emmanuel, what does that mean? It means God with us. Half God, half man. Matthew 1.23 that would be outstanding to any woman to even contemplate being that woman that would be the mother of the Son of God. This Emmanuel was the description of exactly who he was, but it was not his proper name because we know his proper name is Jesus. Matthew 1 21. Jesus, my friend, my Savior. God with me, God with us. In Luke 1 26 through 56, can we only imagine the emotions Mary went through when the angel said to her that day, God has found favor in you, Mary. What? Wait, 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 wait. I'm just a common, ordinary woman. Is this happening to me? He was told by the angel that God had found favor in her that she would become pregnant before she ever knew a man at all. How? By the Holy Spirit Himself. Can you imagine the feeling of any woman here? If that were to happen to you, would your heart be pounding? Would you be frightened? Would you be confused? Would you be trying to put your mind around it and accept it? Well, you don't have too long if you were married because reality finally happened and it happened pretty quick. 
the only one, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was born. He was born. And He would be called the Son of God. And ladies, if it was you, your child would be called the Son of God, my Savior. Your Savior. My friend. Your friend. And only through Him can we approach the throne of God Almighty in prayer. Only because of your Son have I got an opportunity to go to heaven. Because your Son took all that punishment in His body so that I don't have to in hell for eternity. Your Son spilled His blood for me. Oh, I, I cannot imagine the emotions that Mary felt all of her life. Beyond anything, I as a man, and even if I was a woman, I don't believe I could comprehend the emotions that she might have. In this lesson, I want to consider what Mary must have been feeling and thinking as she took the Lord's Supper. Now, information about Mary is very sketchy. So, I can think of six events surrounding Mary, the mother of Jesus, that are recorded in Scripture. Let's look at them. First, His birth and infancy. Matthew chapter 1 and 2. Luke chapter 1 and 2. Ladies, for me to sit here and describe this to you, you would have to describe it to me, but I was there three times with my wife, and I've been there with my children. But the things that a mother goes through, Mary went through. You know, the changes in her own body, the, the maybe morning sickness that she had, maybe the back aches. I see a lot of women carrying babies with their backs hurting all the time. Of course, a lot of us men are sort of built like that. I guess that's why our back hurts. <laughs> but watching her body being transformed, how does that feel, mothers? Was that was it felt like something beyond your control? What's happening to me? I know what's happening mentally, but yeah. but it's really happening. Yeah. All this is going on, and, and I'm getting larger and larger as the days go by, and I'm hungry. Want ice cream and pickles? All of these natural things happening to her body. And she just really had no control over that. But you know, with all that, and then trying to realize this is not just a baby, because babies are precious. This is the Son of God Almighty. I was impregnated by the Holy Spirit. Grasp all that and see what kind of emotions you might have. Yet there comes that wonderful feeling she experienced also. Well, I got to do that when, when my wife was pregnant and I put my hand up there and I'd feel that thing kick. I was always saying, I'm feeling the heavyweight champion of the world. Well, she wasn't. Three times. Kicking. You remember when you put your hands on and you feel them turn over? Can you imagine with me and, and the other men and you're putting our hands on there and feeling that's one thing, but the woman feeling that in her body. Does that not bring a mother closer to a child than any man even might be able to imagine? I would think so. But all that and trying to accept being pregnant with God. And of all people in all the world, Mary must have felt like there's so many much better women than I am on earth, healthier, stronger, maybe more godly. Why has God chose me of all people? Why me, Lord? But there she is, birthing the Son of God. The baby's born. Wonder what her emotions were like when Jesus was lost in Luke 2 41 through 51. You know, the closeness of a mother to her child when he's all of a sudden missing, a little 12 year old boy in a great big old city like Jerusalem, be like losing your child almost in Atlanta. Would that scare you? Uh, is it safe? Is it hurt? 
Has it gone to the hospital? Did someone find it? Has it been kidnapped? I guess all these things may have floated through her mind. The fear that a mother would have at a time like that, I don't even want to uh, try to comprehend, and I don't believe you do either. All those emotions stirring in her mind, and then all of a sudden she finds him teaching in the temple at 12 years old. And all around him, all these other men being amazed as he's teaching in the temple. This 12-year-old child is asking me questions and making comments that, how does he know all this? Of course, we know the answer. And Mary did too, but even though she knew that he was taking care of his father's business, could she really fully grasp emotionally? That's my boy, my little 12-year-old boy that I've been raised, not just raising, that really is the Son of God. Trying to grasp that as well as raise him and be normal emotionally. The wedding feast, John 2. She saw her son. She told everybody around her, hey, do what he tells you to do. You know, there was a wedding feast that run out of wine, all they had was water. It's not the miracle of turning it into wine is the miracle of the power of her son that had the power to immediately turn it into wine. My boy, look at him. Can you imagine? I know, I've been to these little basketball games with the second, third graders, went yesterday. The pride of watching your child or grandchild, in our case, great grandchild, playing basketball. We were watching every footstep she made, every move she made. Oh, it was She had to be better than any player on earth. We were proud of her, just like you are your children. Proud. Can you imagine the pride that Mary felt, the emotions? Seeing her son just take care of business. Wow. Pride in that boy. Mary and his brothers tried to interrupt the preaching of Jesus Christ, Matthew 12, 36. They came, and we don't know why they wanted to interrupt, maybe just to say supper's ready, nobody knows, but they were there, and they wanted to interrupt Him. And someone there said, Jesus, there's your mother and your brothers. Now, here's this proud mama wants to interrupt her son, and she knows she's got the power and respect to do that because she knows he loves her. And she knows that he knows she loves him. When Jesus Christ said, in verse 48 through 50, that his disciples were his mother and brothers, you think that might make her step back? What? What did my son just say? Would that throw you into confusion, ladies? This is my son, and he says, no, my mother and brothers are my disciples? Probably confused her. Again, different emotions this lady is trying to conquer and grasp in her mind. Because she had to be taught like everybody else, the doctrine of Christ, 1 Corinthians 13.9. You see, 1 Corinthians 13, 9 says even the apostles knew in part, but they didn't know in whole. Well, she knew a lot. She was around Jesus all the time from His first, first breath, but she didn't know it all. She didn't know the entire mystery. She only knew what she had heard, what she had learned. And this would confuse any mother. I'm your mother. These are your brothers. But she wouldn't argue with her son because she knew my son, my boy, he's the child of God. How about at the cross? At the cross, John 19, 25, we see Mary at the foot of the cross. Now, just a second ago, we talked about her maybe being confused. All this will straighten it up. She's sitting there watching her son hang on that cross, bloody, sweaty, in so much pain. You can see 
the nails driven through his hands. This was part of the hand of the Roman so it wouldn't fall off. And through his feet and him on that cross. And she saw him dying. The last horrible moments of his life on earth. And I could just see Jesus raising his head and looking at his mother. And Jesus Christ said, Behold, your son. Mama, it's me. Mm. And then he told his disciples, Brothers, behold your mother. In other words, you take care of mama. And then, he's gone. It's finished. What emotions do you think that a mother would experience at that time? In the upper room in Acts 1.14, a little bit later, we see Mary with the disciples in the upper room. Mary is with them. Praying in one accord all together. <laughs> After he had gone to his Father in heaven, described in Acts 1 9 through 11, where he is now raised to the right hand of God Almighty. Who are we talking about, Mary? My boy. He's there. After this whole sermon, brothers and sisters, there's one event that's not recorded. In the Bible. It's the one where Mary, we know, would have engaged in, in doing. It's the Lord's Supper. What kind of emotions would she have if she's with us today and gathered with us as we partake of the table in a few moments? Would she have gratitude? As mentioned in John 15, 13. You know, she had been taught that her son was also her friend. Well, I want to be my daughter's papa. My granddaughter's papa. My great-granddaughter's papa. I'm pop. But you know, I want to be their friend. And Jesus Christ was the friend of His mother, and His mother was His friend. If we could just muster a small part of the emotions that Mary had to feel, When she partook of the Lord's Supper, it's not recorded, but you know his mama. You know his mama partook of it because can you imagine the woman I just described not giving the respect to the Lord's table, not remembering her son on the first day of the week? She understood more than any of us that he did not have to die. He died because he loved us. She knew. She would never disrespect not partaking in the Lord's Supper, not being here unless it's an absolute must. I can't. And then God would forgive you. And church, I, I love saying this. Each one of us as, child, as a child of God are a friend of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 11, 27-29 we would be guilty, oh, I don't want to do this, of the body of Christ if we disrespected our communion. I don't want to disrespect it. I'm not thinking of a hamburger. I'm thinking about what Jesus done with me and for me on that cross. We would never drink the cup in an unworthy manner, would we? This is the Lord's body and His blood that it's represented right here in front of me. Did she feel sorrow and guilt? Well, how could she? Ask any mother that has not questioned her own integrity when one of her children grows up it's not what they wanted to do, it makes a mistake. They all somehow, and the, and the husbands do too, feel guilty. What did I do wrong? And maybe you didn't raise it perfect. I'm sure you didn't. But could she not have changed something to keep her son from being crucified on the cross? I give her answer right now, and you could too. No. That's what he came for, Mary. That's why he came here. 
So don't feel guilty. Uh, you can have a lot of sorrow. We see Mary sharing what she felt in Luke chapter 1, verse 46 through 56. And girls, there's your homework for tonight. You want to be touched in your heart and soul? Read the Song of Mary as it's titled in most Bibles. Luke 1, 46 through 56, and see how Mary felt about this child that she was going to have. Experience of being chosen to be the mother of the Son of God. Now Mary rejoiced to the Lord. This is all she had to fall back on. Any of us that have lost a child, the only thing we can fall back to keep our sanity is the thought of, I love God, God loves me, and that's where my child is. Knowing what her son had done, not only for her, but us and all of humanity, she had to find some kind of pleasure in that. Matthew 26 and 28, and like us all, Mary had sins. Oh yeah, she had a little gift. She must have realized the sacrifice was for her as much as anybody. But she came to repentance and a resolve. Resolve. 1 Corinthians 11, 28. We are taught to examine ourselves. We'll do that this morning. Make sure that I'm right with God before I partake of the Lord's Supper. Oh, John, what do you have to do? Do you have to go to classes to be able to get ready? No. If you're a child of God, all you got to do is ask God Almighty to forgive your sins. And the way you do that, you go to Him in prayer through Jesus Christ. And you ask Him, please forgive me. And commit yourself again to God. Decide to love Him, obey Him, walk in the light, do what you're supposed to do, and everything's took care of. Then partake of the plate. We need to repent and commit ourselves. Let us never forget what Jesus has done for us, church. And I want us to be, I want us to be remembering Him. Let us not succumb to this cold formalism. Here's the tray. Here's the tray. Next. Here comes the bread which represents the body of Mary's Son and my Savior, Jesus Christ. The Son of God. He gave that life up for me in that body. This is not some little ritualism we're going to go through. This is a very important part of our worship. We've met for centuries as the church. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, it talks about us coming together on the first day of the week to break bread and to listen to the Word of, of God. We come together on the first day of the week to break bread and worship hearing God's Word because we're commanded to do so. It's expected of us. We're going to continue steadfastly in the doctrine of Christ and that's what's taught in the doctrine of Christ. Not what man thinks, not what man comes up with. We're going to go by the Word of God. Amen? Amen. God's people have met every Sunday to partake of this communion. This coming together as we join hands and thoughts and minds and spirits. We're going to remember our Savior if we could only do that like Mary did. It's my hope that this lesson has somehow brought us all to a better understanding. Going through the thoughts of Mary as she would partake of the table with us this morning. If I could just come to a small realization in my own life and soul, all the meaning of what this table means to us. Brothers and sisters, if you're not a member of the body of Christ, there's only one way to become that. You've got to hear the Gospel. You've got to believe it with all of your heart. You've got to repent of your sins. I want to put everything wrong behind me. Anything in my past, I'm going to put it over. I will not have it hanging on my head on Judgment Day. It's going to be gone. And if I need to do that publicly, I'll do it. If I'm a child of God already and I've sinned, I have to do it that way. If I haven't become a child of God, I've got to be willing to change anything. And then you know what I'm going to do?
I'm going to confess Jesus Christ before the world. Jesus Christ is the Son of God Almighty. And I want to be baptized to wash my sins away, Acts 2.38, into the body of Christ, Galatians 3.27. And I want to be added to the church the only way I can, by the Lord Himself, Acts 2.47. Brothers and sisters, if anyone here has a need, please take care of it as we stand and sing. When Jesus comes to reward His servant